Well, glory. This is Dudley. Good to be back with you again this month. It's always good to be with you. It happens to be in the middle of the summer in Texas right now, and it is nice and warm. I hope you're cool wherever you are. And it's always good to know that these can go on for days and years beyond here so that you may be listening to this at some point where you're sitting by the fire. I hope so. All right. Uh, hey, we had some friends who uh, took on the responsibility of revamping Orphans No More. It's been one of the best-selling little books that we've done, and we had some friends who paid for its revamping, and so we have got it republished, and it's nicer and better, and I recommend that you get, get Orphans No More, and read it yourself and get your family to read it and get your small group to read it. Uh, order Orphans No More. You're going to love, you're going to love the new set. And, uh, we got some things coming up this fall. Uh, it will cool off at some point and we will be having the treasure hunt weekend, uh, the 15th, 16th, 17th of September. That's for the ladies. It's already filling up. So if you ladies want to come, you need to register pretty quickly. And then the, like the first weekend in October 5th, 6th, 7th, something like that, we're doing the uh, Beyond Happiness weekend. That's, that's a marriage retreat. Uh, we've had people come to that who were not yet married but wanted to know what marriage is all about from a gospel point of view. And uh, they, they participated as well. And we would love to have you. That also is filling up. People are, are registering for that. So I recommend that you go ahead and get on the calendar for those things. Then later in, in October, we'll do the uh, Theological Roundtable. That's kind of an invitation-only thing. It's pretty intense uh, theological study. But it's, wonder, it's a wonderful time this year we're dealing with uh, one of the books of Timothy. Okay, let's talk this, uh, let's talk this month about, mm, there are lots of ways you could talk about this. We could call it now what, or uh, what do we do now <laughs> type thing. So, so let, let me set the stage. What we've talked about a great deal and we'll continue to talk about is the big story of the Bible and how God intended to, uh, to have a people on the earth that would enjoy him as much as he enjoyed himself. And they would be his co-laborers on the earth, discovering and developing all that he had put in creation and, and causing all of creation to glorify him. So he, uh, he, he created humans in his own image so they could enjoy him. Well, you know the story of the Bible of how the serpent in the garden tempted Eve and Adam and they fell. And when they did, uh, sin entered into the picture. Um, men was perverted, become self-conscious, afraid, ashamed, hiding, uh, blaming. And, and that became the tenor of hum humanity. But, uh, but God has... Did not give up. Uh, he he knew exactly what he was doing, and so he began to move toward in on the earth. He began to move toward a time when mankind would be redeemed, and everything that sin had affected would be restored and reconciled to God and restored. And so that's the that's the theme of the Bible. It's the story of the Bible. We've talked a great deal in here about the gospel and how the gospel is how God uh, brought about this uh, redemption, reconciliation, restoration thing. And we saw that God um, made a promise to Eve in the garden, made a promise to all of those in the garden that there would come a day in the future when the seed of woman would bruise the head of uh, the seed of Satan and that Satan's uh, offspring would uh, bruise the heel of the seed of woman. That happened in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the seed of woman, and his death crushed the head of Satan. And Satan, of course, struck the heel of Christ, and uh, but did not crush his head. 
So we have this theme going through the whole Bible that God, God is, uh, has committed himself to bringing a restoration. So when the world got bad, uh, God could have just destroyed the whole world and started all over. But he decided, based on his promise, that he would preserve humanity. So Noah was the instrument. Then later, Abraham, uh, God went to Abraham and said, it'll be through your seed that will crush the head of Satan. So the whole story of Abraham is, uh, is about all that, how all that developed. And then uh, when Abraham's descendants were down in Egypt and under the terrible control of Pharaoh and the Egyptian powers, God said, uh, I remember my promise. So he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, took them through the Red Sea, fed them with manna from heaven, defeated their enemies, made water run out of a rock. All of this in fulfillment of his promise that there will come a day when I will crush the head of Satan through the instrument of humans. And that's how, how God is designed to do it. So, so the story of the Bible continues to move. Israel uh, went into captivity later and, because they broke the covenant. And, but, but God said, I'm not done. Uh, they, they violated the covenant. They deserve to be wiped off the face of the earth. But I, I remember my covenant. I will, I will find a way to get done what I promised to get done. So uh, 400 years after a remnant went back from the Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem and Israel, uh, 400 years later, John the Baptist came forth on the scene. Then Jesus comes forth on the scene. And finally, the seed has arrived. The seed that would crush the head of Satan. The seed that, whose heel would be bruised. And, and that, was, that was Jesus. So when, when Jesus was on the cross, what looked to the human eye like defeat for righteousness, defeat for God, defeat for the plan of God, what looked like absolute destruction became ultimate salvation. Jesus died on the cross. Yes, that's a tragedy. That's a victory. When he died on the cross, he took sin upon himself. He killed sin. He paid the penalty of sin. He crushed the head of Satan. He took away from Satan the power of death. He took away Satan the, 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 the fear of death. He took away the law. He fulfilled the law through Jesus. He, he, he took it all away so that Satan's head is crushed. And then Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and sent back the Holy Spirit to live in his people. And it is, it is there that we live today. We live in that chapter of the story. And our job right now is to enforce what uh, Jesus bought and paid for. We are to enjoy and enforce the victory of, of the cross. We do that by living it and by preaching it by praying it in, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So we live in that period of history. It's called by theologians the already but not yet period. Already the price has been paid. Already the battle has been fought. Already the enemy has been defeated. But it has not yet been fully manifested uh, on the earth. We're still waiting for creation to be recreated and there to be a new heaven and a new earth. We're still waiting for our bodies to be resurrected and we have resurrected bodies. There's some things that are still in the future, but we are living in that time when we do have the authority of the name of Jesus and the power of the spirit that raised him from the dead. With that, with those resources, we are to live in life and demonstrate what, uh, what God's life is all about when God shares his life with a human. So that, that's where we are. Now, what does that look like? That's why I'm calling this the now what message. What does that look like? How do we live? One of the ways it's described by Paul is in terms of warfare. He says that there's a, there's a war still going on. The devil is still an enemy of God. He, hell still strategizes against the plans and purposes and the very person of God. And of course, he is strategizing against God's body, the body of Christ that's on the earth. That's 
his church. And he would like to create uh, destruction and turmoil on the earth. He would like to turn what God made into a cosmos. He'd like to turn it back to chaos. And so there, there's this battle going on and the, and the enemy is fighting. He fights with deception. That's his main, that's his main deal. He, he can't kill you without God's permission. He can't touch you without God's permission. He can, but he lies. And he can get you to believe things that are not true. And in believing those, you experience things that are unhealthy, destructive, and, uh, and even bring death. So in Ephesians chapter 6, we come to that concluding part of, the, of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And he's, he's describing what we're to do now in terms of war. And I'm going to read that. I know you've read it probably many times, but I want you to read it with a, with a new, new eye. I want you to see it as this is where we are now in the story. This is what we're to do, and this is what God is doing. Uh, we're not here to speculate about the last days of the, of the earth. We're not, we're not here to take over militarily, politically, whatever. What are we here to do? We're here to fight the battle that God has left us to fight. So I'm going to read it. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. There are schemes of the devil. He schemes every day. They are going on. It is happening. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Okay, so what's the battle against? It's not flesh and blood, so we're not fighting our political enemy, our theological enemy, our racial enemy. We're not, we're not our national enemy. We're not fighting. That's not the issue. The issue is we're fighting at a level that's the invisible level. It is the spiritual level. It is the level that is behind the scenes causing the scenes to happen. And we get to fight back there. We get to fight at that level, which means we get, uh, we're, we're not limited just to the battlefield of flesh and blood and ideas and so forth. So, uh, <clears throat> By the way, the, the first phrase there was very important. Uh, be strong in the power of his might. Uh, the only way you can fight this battle is if you fight it in the power of, of Jesus. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to us because none of us can whip the devil. You, he's, he, you can't. You're not in a battle against the devil. Jesus is in a battle against the devil and he is working through us to get his thing done. And Jesus has already de uh, defeated the, the enemy. So let me keep reading. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the, the readiness of given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now there's so much in that. So let, let's see if we can just grab some of the salient points out of that that's really important. First of all, war is serious. It's not casual. It's not okay we're down here, we're God's creation. He, uh, he saved us through Jesus. And, and, and so we're just kind of hanging around till we go to heaven and let's do some good things while we're here. And, 
And there's some things that are better choices than other cho choices. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, uh, so, you know, there, there, there's no, there's nothing big at stake here. I mean, uh, we're all human. We're all trying to do the best we can. And so uh, we're just kind of cruising through this whole deal. No, the scripture says that God has strategically placed us here at this time in history between the ascension of Christ and the sending the Holy Spirit, between that event and the final coming of Christ when he comes to culminate everything. We live in a very strategic part of history where we are implementing what he bought and paid for at the cross and that there is a strategy from hell to stop that. And we are in a battle. We are in a battle with someone stronger than we are. Therefore, we're going to have to learn to, to operate in the power of another. We are in a battle with someone who is, uh, likes to hide behind the camouflage of, of non-existence. One of the problems we have today is that most people are not, a, are, are not consciously aware that we're in a, in a war. Like, nah, it's not much, not a big deal. Or... There are others who go, oh my goodness, we're in a war. And so they get so involved in all the, the intricacies of studying demons and demonology and uh, hell and all, all of that, that they get enamored with the war. And so the, the, neither one of those are very healthy. So wh what I wanted us to talk about is how serious the matter is. Uh, there's a picture I want to use here uh, in the Old Testament. We have, we have the story of David, young David, son of Jesse, who went out to where the battle was raging between Israel and the Philistines. Now, the, Israel was God's army. The Philistines was, represented an army of pagans and idolaters, those who had rejected God. So there's this battle going on. David goes out to take some uh, cheese and crackers to his brothers on the field of battle. He discovers uh, a dismaying thing. There's, there's this giant, called his name is Goliath. He's down in the valley. He comes out every morning about daylight, between daylight and sunup, and he mocks the, the, the God of Israel and the armies of Israel. And he says to them, all, all you cowards, one of you come out here and fight me. There's no need in engaging the battle with the whole army. It's just one man, man oh man oh, you, you against me, whoever wins, they win the whole deal. Well, nobody wanted to fight Goliath. He was nine feet tall. He was strong. He was, he was, he was mammoth. Nobody would fight him. So everybody kept their back turned, dropped their heads. Even Saul, the king of Israel, who was head and shoulders taller than almost any other Israelite, uh, he wouldn't fight him either. Everybody was scared. And David was absolutely appalled. What do you mean, he said? You're letting that Philistine, that uncircumcised, blasphemous, pagan Philistine mock the armies of God, thereby mocking God? You can't do that. I'll fight him. So David, he's a young, young teenage boy. David says, I'll, I'll fight him. Well, that, you know, Saul says, okay, why don't you take my armor? You know, that's what I contribute to the battle. I'll give you my armor. Well, Saul's, you know, he's nearly seven foot tall himself. He, so David puts that on. David's probably five, two. Uh, he puts that stuff on. He can't even see out the top. He, he, he's totally lost in the armor. He says, I can't do that. I'll fight in my own armor. So what was his armor? Well, you say he had a, had a sling and a rock, uh, five rocks, and uh, that was his armor. I tell you what his armor was. He went out in the name of his God. He somehow knew that the battle was not against him and Goliath. The battle was between God and those who denied God. And so he came out in the name of God and said, I'll fight him and it doesn't matter what he's got, how long his sword is, and it doesn't matter what kind of tools I have. I can have a slingshot, I can have a BB gun. I, I, I can... I can throw a pebble or I can throw a boulder. It doesn't matter because God is the one who's going to decide this battle. So he goes out with all the confidence in the world, but he went out in the confidence in the name 
of God. Hey, in Psalm 118, let me read you this. You'll, you'll love this. Psalm 118, uh, we have the, the psalmist saying, uh, talking about this power of this name. There it is. So listen to this. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like fire among the thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I, I love that. Psalm 18, first few verses. David understood that. He understood what it means to go out in the name of, of God. And when Paul here is talking to us about the warfare we're in, the very first thing he, he wants us to understand is you have to operate in the power of his might. You go in his name. You don't go in your own strength. You don't go in your own smartness. You go in his name. So that's, uh, that, uh, that, that's key to what, what we're talking about here. Now, as we get into the passage, we see that Paul is helping us to understand what, what's happening. So he said, let me tell you what your battle is against. You're dealing with rulers who are controlled by evil spirits. You're, you're dealing with systems that have rulers in them, and the systems were developed by people with evil spirits for the purpose of oppressing some and alleviating others. You have cosmic powers these are spirits that rule over darkness. They rule over ideologies of era. Listen to me. We are in a battle today in our country, the country of the United States. It's all over the world, but, but we're here. We're dealing with an agenda from hell, agendas from hell, ideologies that carry with it the power of, of spiritual deception for those who have said, I, I choose not to acknowledge God as God, God allows these people to believe these lies and to buy into these ideologies and to promote them as if they were uh, salvation, truth, gospel, and the whole thing. And so we're battling things on the, on the sexual level, on the transgender level, on the gender level, on the, on the border level, uh, all of these areas we're dealing with issues that have to do with spiritual powers, spiritual ideologies. And uh, it, it's not just, you know, somebody had an opinion. It's like, well, I kind of think this and you kind of think that. And, uh, you know, we, we can just get along. Here, here's one of the great misnomers of today. There are people who are saying, well, let's just get along. We need bipartisanism. Let's just all get along. Let's all get along. Let's all get along. Uh, there is no fellowship with light with dark, of light with darkness, and the ideology of uh, of godlessness cannot mix with the truth that there is, is a God. Does it mean that we're to be angry and ugly and hateful and 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 treat people uh, without dignity? No, 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 no. But what it means is our problem is deeper than just saying we all need to sit down and just say. Let's all agree that we uh, disagree, but we'll come up with something. No, that is not going to work because we are battling something greater than an, just an idea. We're battling an ideology. An ideology is an idea that is taken on personality, power, agenda, and it is being ruled by cosmic forces. We're in that kind of battle. So if you don't know the gospel, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know how to put on this armor we're talking about right here, you're not going to be effective in that battle. So uh, let's, look at, let's look at the description here of what he says. 
I want you to get dressed up, he said. Get dressed up in the armor, the whole armor of God. And I want you to stand. Not fight, stand. You stand in the victory that Christ has already won for us. If you stand in that victory, you are fighting, but you're fighting without fighting. <laughs> you're fighting by standing because Christ has, has fought the battle for you. So let's look at some of these things. So he says, here's how you stand in the evil day. You stand with the girdle of truth. The girdle was like a belt that gathered up all the rest of the tools and weapons and tunics and whatever, but it, it, it held everything together. The, the, the belt of truth. What is truth? Well, it's not what, it's who. Jesus is truth and believers in Christ know the truth. They don't just know some doctrine, some facts, some information, some, some ideas that are better than us. No, they know truth. They know reality. They understand reality because they have submitted to the one who declares what is real and what is not real. So it, it is truth. What, what truth? The truth of the gospel, that here is the story of history. Here's the story of reality. Here's what's wrong with man. Uh, so here's the, here's the truth as the Bible teaches. God is sovereign. God created man in his own image with, with, his, with dignity. Man sinned and fell into, uh, into, into sin, into perversion. In that perversion, he cannot uh, extricate himself. He can't, get, he can't save himself. So God came in the person of, uh, first of all, he chose Israel to be a, a, a nation that would represent him. And he gave them a law that they couldn't keep to show that no man can keep the law. So Israel revealed the incapacity of humanity to live up to the standards of God. So what happened? Jesus came as an Israelite. He came as a man. He lived a perfect life. He lived up to the covenant that God required of Israel. He died on the cross. He took the sin of, of the whole world upon himself. He absorbed that sin, took that, that, that wrath, satisfied justice, and in doing that, he released us to be partners with God on the earth. That's truth. That's the true story. That's the truth that if you believe that truth, it opens up everything for you to understand what's the problem with mankind, what's the solution to mankind's problem, uh, what are we to do, how are we to live. That's the truth. So, so the girdle of truth is the truth as fulfilled and epitomized in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we put on the, the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. What is that? Breastplate covers, you know, the vitals here, righteousness. Do you know the only righteousness that you have and that I have is, is what's called an alien righteousness? That doesn't mean you got it from Mars or Venus or somewhere. It means you got it from somebody other than yourself. It's alien to you. You, you, you didn't create it. And so anytime you're focused on your own qualifications and am I qualified enough to fight the devil? Am I qualified enough to pray? Am I qualified enough to, to do what God says? As long as you're thinking like that, you've already been hit by one of the fiery darts. Your righteousness is in Christ Jesus. He, his, his righteousness was transferred to us. And as I stand before God, I stand before him as righteous as Jesus. I'm either that righteous or I'm not righteous at all. There's no in between. And so that breastplate of righteousness where the fiery darts of the enemy are coming and condemning me and telling me I'm disqualified, I've sinned too much, I've, done, uh, uh, I've rejected God, I've come back to him too many times. Whatever he is saying, if it's getting through, if, if I'm focusing on myself and my own qualifications, then I have, have, uh, I'm I'm defeated in that battle. So I put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says, I put on the shoes of peace. What does that mean? It means that as we're fighting the battle, as we're moving around, our shoes, are, our feet are steadfast. We stand in the peace of God. The peace that God made between man and God, he reconciled man to God. The peace that God gives us between uh, uh, ourselves and uh, creation, and even the peace that God makes possible between human beings. That, 
that we stand in the peace of God. I'm not striving. I'm not trying to get anything done. I'm not trying to win the battle on my own. I'm not trying to change somebody. I'm not trying to fix somebody. I am standing in the reality that God has done in Christ all that needs to be done for God to be satisfied, for covenant to be fulfilled, and for him to pour blessings out upon us. So I stand in that peace. I can rest. The, the, the next uh, armor is the shield of faith, which is able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, which lets you know there are some fiery darts coming. There are fiery darts of accusation. There are fiery darts of temptation. There are fiery darts of, of lies. There are fiery, fiery darts of fantasy. Fiery darts of fantasy. All of these things are coming against us. If you don't know you're being shot at, you won't know when you're hit and you're, and you're debilitated. So, so, the, so we have this shield of faith. What, what, is, what kind of faith is he talking about? I just need to go down to the faith store and buy me up a bunch of faith or go to the church and I, I, I need to work up a bunch of faith. No, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. <clears throat> Faith, the real faith that is able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked is the word that is revealed in Christ Jesus that he is my Lord, he is my, my Messiah, he is my say, he is my life. And as he speaks to me, as his word becomes real to me, then I can in, in, apply his truth in every situation in life. Therefore, in all circumstances, I can quench these accusations, condemnations, temptations that come to my mind. Please do not fall prey to like, well, I, I've got these terrible thoughts. What's wrong with me? Your mind is a target of the enemy and the, the, lots of these thoughts that are coming to you, coming straight from hell. They're not your thoughts. They're the devil's thoughts, but it's your responsibility to shut them down. You have the shield of faith. Does that word fit with what Jesus says? No, kick it out. Does that word fit with what Jesus said? Yes, okay. Then it becomes new, uh, nutrition to us. Otherwise, it becomes poison to us. So there's a shield of faith. Then the helmet of salvation. Uh, another place in Thessalonians, he talks about the helmet of the hope of salvation. I, uh, I think that's what he's saying in both places. What is the hope of salvation? My hope of salvation, my confidence in salvation is based on the finished work of Christ. It's not based on did I pray the right prayer? Was I baptized deep enough? Uh, have I tried hard enough? Am I praying long enough? Did I fast enough times? It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with any of that. The hope of my salvation is that the Jesus who started a work in me will finish it. He is the one who initiated my salvation. He's the one who came and paid for my salvation. He is the one who sent the Holy Spirit to sustain my salvation. He is the one who comes again to restore everything to right that has been made wrong. He has guaranteed by giving me the down payment of the Holy Spirit that everything he had in mind in restoration, I get. My salvation is secure. I don't know how people pray confidently who don't know that they're saved, who, who, who think, well, I don't know if I confessed enough of my sins. I don't know if I, if I overlooked any. I don't know if my heart's pure. I don't know if my motives were right. <clears throat> How are you ever going to pray? I have to pray based on the faithfulness of Jesus to me, not me to Jesus. My faithfulness is not very good. His is perfect. So my salvation is, uh, my hope of salvation is, is confident. So, <clears throat> all of these are kind of defensive. Deal. This is the armor I put on so that I can stand in the battle. Now, having stood, what do I do? Well, he said, you got one weapon that's offensive. It's the sword of the Spirit. Not your sword. Sword of the Spirit. The Spirit is living in you to do in you what God wants done. You're His partner. So, what does the Spirit use? The Word of God. You mean the Bible? Well, the Word of God's in the Bible. 
But that's not exactly what he's talking about here. He's not talking about the Bible because a lot of the Bible hadn't even been written then. What he's talking about is the truth of who God is and how he's revealed himself through Jesus Christ and the gospel. So he's talking about the sword of the spirit is the truth of the gospel. And when you apply the truth of the gospel to any situation in life, it unravels it and cuts through, uh, cuts the, between the sword, uh, the soul and the spirit and, and exposes what's really there so that you can see what God is doing and what, what needs to be addressed. So we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We have the word living in us. We have the Bible in front of us with the words of God on it. And the two of those together as the Holy Spirit brings that together, bring to us life so that we're able to walk into any situation and dissect it and take it apart and, uh, and, uh, and do what God's told us to do as far as uh, bringing about restoration. Now, here's the interesting thing. We're all dressed up in all this defensive stuff. We got the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We have that. What are we to do? Well, there's a lot, a lot of people today confused about that. So, okay, do we, do we need to protest? Do we need to go to the college campus? I mean, the, 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 the pagans have taken over the college campus, taken over education, taken over government, taken over politics, taken over science. Now we can't, we can't get, you can't even get a, a true word on that. Taking over. So, what, what do we need to do? Protest, whatever. Well, you can protest. I'm not against all that. But here's what he said: Do pray. He said, "Oh no, man! I got to do something more and pray. Pray and won't get anything done." Uh, if you're dealing with spiritual powers, if they're the ones causing the problem, I suggest that the only place you are going to get anything done is in prayer, because it's in prayer that you engage the spiritual world. And it's, it's in prayer that you're bringing to bear the powers of heaven on the strategies of hell. Uh, in the book of uh, Revelation, as John is looking into the heavenlies, he's looking into the spiritual reality. He sees smoke going up uh, as incense. It goes into the heavenlies. And an angel of the Lord at the altar of God, takes that smoke and mixes it with fire from the altar and flings it back to earth. And when John asked, what is that? What's that a symbol of? What's that a picture of? They said, those are the prayers of the saints. The saints send up the smoke. The angel of the Lord takes the smoke, mixes it with the purposes of God, flings it back to earth, and things change. That is how we, co we uh, are co-laborers with God. We are co-laborers with God first, by being instruments of prayer. We dress up so that we're not knocked down, disqualified, beat up, condemned. We, we dress up in Christ. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is able to go into any situation. And because He is committed to us, even when we don't know what to say, He'll put words into our mouth. Isn't it interesting that one of the things Paul asked them to pray for for him was, Pray that words will be put in my mouth and I'll say the right thing at the right time. Hey, pray that for me. I'll pray that for you. If you've got to go to the city council meeting to stand up, if you've got to go to the board meeting, school board meeting, if you've got to, wherever you need to go, you need words to say. You have the, you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I can pray that, that you have words to say that will have heavenly impact in that whole situation. So here we are. We're, we're living in between the time of uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit to indwell the believers and the body of Christ. We are the living body of Christ on the earth. We are here to implement the victory that Jesus won at the cross. And, as we, and, the, and the primary way we, we do that is we pray. There's nothing more dangerous to hell than an alert, well-dressed saint who knows he can pray. Now, you say, that is, 
we got we got we got to do more. We got to take up arms. We we need a revolution. We we got to do, we've got to do more than that. Well, you can do more than that later, but if you don't pray first, your revolution won't work. You wind up trying to reform society instead of seeing society transform, because society is not reformed by changing structures. Uh, it's change. It's it's transformed by changing humans, individuals. As their heart is changed, then their ideologies change. As their ideologies change, their structures change. As their structures change, their systems change. And so it's possible for there to be a society where there is flourishing going on because it is, it is according to the, to the plan of God. So, <clears throat> so here we are living in this crucial time when we are being threatened as never before in our lifetime with ideologies that are simply crazy. They are irrational. They are demonic. They are coming from the point of view of chaotic uh, destruction rather than an organized cosmos that God has designed. So we're seeing it attacking our children, attacking their, genre, uh, their, their, uh, their sex, their identity, their education, their mind. We're seeing it attack our government. We're seeing it attack the church. It's attacking everywhere. So you say, well, we'll just sit back and wait till Jesus comes back and we'll all get out. We've been left down here to, uh, to demonstrate that we are light in a dark world and we're salt in a perverted world. So it, it's time that we stood up. But let's fight the way he said fight. Jesus did the fighting. I do the standing. And because I stand, I can pray. And when I pray, God answers. And when God answers, then I can act. And so this is how God has chosen to, to work in his people during this chapter in the story. Now, if we were living in the time of <clears throat> Moses, it would be a, a little bit different how, how, how things were we going. Uh, but this is how we are to act as the body of Christ. We live in a very strategic time, and it's our time to stand up. First of all, show up, stand up, speak up, pray up. And let's see what, what God does. So remember this. When you think that you're so insignificant and that dart will come through, you're not doing anything. You're just praying. Do something. Start an organization. Do something. When you think you're doing nothing, kick that, that fiery dart out and believe this. There's nothing scarier to the devil and hell than an alert, well-dressed saint who knows how to pray. That's you. And as you walk through the venues of life, you pray. And you say, what if I don't know how to pray? Ah, the Holy Spirit will pray for you. He'll pray through you. And he'll pray for you when you don't, you don't know how to pray. Hey, this is the good deal we've got here. This is the good victory we have. And so we're not just waiting till the end, hoping that Jesus will snatch us out of here. We are walking in the middle of the battle and we walk with the assurance of the victory. We, like David, uh, we like the, the army of, of David when he fought Goliath, we get the, we get the benefits of our champion's victory. Remember in the David and Goliath story, you're not David. You're not Saul. You're not Goliath. You know who you probably are? You're one of those soldiers over there in the tent, scared absolutely to death. But when your champion comes out and beats their champion, it encourages you and you start going and running the other guys down and picking up the spoils of war. That's where we are. So as we live in, a, in this very important time, it is a war. It's not a party, and it's not a game. It's not just the national championship. It's a whole lot more important than all that. It's a war, and you get to play a part. What a privilege. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for letting us be alive during this time. I think that you hadn't left us here 
to fight the devil on our own. I thank you that you have not left us here to be a target of the devil without any protection. I thank you that you have fully clothed us with yourself. You defeated the enemy and you've given us the tools we need for what we're called to do. So I thank you for, for the armor. I thank you for the spirit. Thank you for the word of God that lives in us. And I thank you for the privilege of prayer. And as we exercise it, I thank you that, that you will answer. Give us eyes to see it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being with me this, this month. <clears throat> Until next time, this is Dudley Hall with Kerygma Ventures. <laughs>